Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Stephen Ginsburg, and I'm your facilitator for tonight. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Age, Frailty, Loneliness, and Suicide. We've got about um, 2,700 people registered for the webinar tonight. Not all of them will come, um, but there'll also be a possibility to view uh, the recording when it gets sent out to you. Uh, and please share with your friends and colleagues. So I'd like to start by acknowledging that this nationwide webinar is held on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land, always was and always will be. And also acknowledging all First Nations people who are attending tonight and paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging. We have much to learn from you and your elders about the care of older people. The theme of Reconciliation Week was Be Brave, Make Change. And the theme of next week's NADOC Week is Get Up, Stand Up, Show Up. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders of the many cultures of these lands and thank carers for their support of older people. I'm speaking from Gamma Regal land, and perhaps some of you would like to share and enter into the chat room on which land you are tonight. I'd also like to say a special welcome to the members of the Sydney North Older Persons Mental Health Network, of which I'm a co-coordinator, and to other networks around Australia who are meeting tonight to watch this broadcast. MHPN currently supports six older persons mental health networks across the country, and details of these networks and how to join them will be listed in the closing slides. This webinar is the result of a unique partnership between the 31 primary health networks and the Mental Health Professionals Network. And in a first in their history, the 31 PHNs have formed a consortium and engaged MHPN to plan, produce and broadcast webinars focusing on older Australians and mental health. I, will be, I have been facilitating all of these and tonight's webinar is the fifth of the series and there is one more to come later in the year. All of the previous webinars are in the library on the MHPN website. Now, all the panelists' bios were sent out to you in the uh, invitation, so I won't go through their, their bios one by one, but uh, uh, we'll put them up on the screen briefly, and they all have their names tagged to their images. By way of registration, you were asked to submit a question that you'd like the panel to consider. There were about, well, there were over 200 questions submitted. So um, we've distilled some of these and uh, we well, we've tried to distill most of them. And um, uh, you will have some of these questions put by me to our panelists. Quite a few people in their questions have asked about the effects of previous trauma for both women and men and how this trauma is expressed in older life. Uh, our last webinar was on this topic, so it's really worthwhile going into the library on the website of the past webinars and uh, having a look at that, that webinar if that's an area of your interest. Um, trauma certainly previous trauma lies behind many of the behaviours um, of us older people. I can include myself in that at 74, um, us older people in our later life. So you're an amazing audience with all of your, the, the number of who've registered and the number of questions you've sent in. And I can't imagine what it would be like if you were all putting up your hands while we were talking. So. Um, Let's get started. Um, 
Some elders have shared that they've forgotten who they are, whether through the trauma of colonization, refugee or migrant displacement from homelands, or the familiar loss of the community that many may once have had. And they say that sometimes they feel invisible. Can I start by asking you, Sandy, as someone who welcomes such people into your RACFs, residential aged care facilities, how we can help these older people? Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, I think no one wants to uh, enter a residential aged care facility. Um, but it's important to keep uh, the older person and their families informed and demystify uh, that they're not, the, not just the place where you go to die and that it can become their home. And the way we do that is uh, they, they develop a sense of community when they come in into the f home facility and they meet other people with similar life stories, similar uh, ages and stages. Perhaps they've been isolated in the community and the only people that visit them are their families or maybe the neighbour pops in. And then they come in and suddenly there's 20, 30, 40, however many people around them where they can reminisce, they can share their life stories, the staff who are looking after them also know some of that background as well. So I think in a lot of ways, um, they perhaps have been a little bit more lost in the community where their world has shrunk. And now when they come into us, their world opens up again. So I think that's probably one of the key messages that I, over many years, have been speaking to families and, and to residents. Uh, to help them understand that we're not the baddies if they do need that extra support and care. And probably no one's asked them for their life history in I a love, long time. I love their life stories. They're, they're amazing. They've, um, they've got so much to offer. And I think for the young generation who are looking after them, I think that makes it more meaningful for them as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, Viviana, or Viv, in your experience, what does the research tell us about the most effective interventions and protective factors that we can offer to support someone who's very sad and may be at risk of suicide and may have forgotten who they are? Yeah, um, I guess we know, the research tells us that the first problem here is that we're not very good at recognising, acknowledging when an older person is actually experiencing sadness or depression, right? So unfortunately, um, as a community, as professionals, but also as family members and friends, the research tells us we do tend to dismiss these symptoms. We tend to normalise it as being a part of being older, right? So oh, it's they're just grumpy because they're a grumpy old man. That's what grump, that's what men do when they get old, right? Oh, she's, uh, you know, worrying and nervy, but that's because, you know, she's frail or that's because, um, you know, she's <clears throat> she just spends all the time at home. And we forget that actually when we see an older person who is sad, who is nervy, that it actually probably signifies distress, emotional distress, um, and we actually need to do something about it. So I think that's the first message, right? Let's make sure we do something about this when we notice it. Um, and so in the resources I believe you've been given access to, there are some links there to some um, helpful resources that have been developed um, by the um, Australian Association for Gerontology about how to talk to someone who you think might be sad. Um, and there are some other resources from um, the Centre for Ageing, Cognition and Wellbeing there. So check those out. And of course, we have to remember that older men have the highest completed suicide rates in Australia, all right? So, again, if we see an older man or an older lady who's looking a bit sad, we have to really take care to check it out. We have to ask and say, are you okay? What's going on? Tell me about it. And we do need to say, you know, are you at, are you at risk? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? You know, how how are you looking forward to the future? Um, because we do know that for older people, when they make intents for self-harm, unfortunately, those intentions can be pretty significant and they are more likely to follow through. 
Now, in terms of evidence for how we might help these people, the good news is that the evidence suggests that older people can benefit from interventions for depression just as well as younger people can. So that includes older people who might have physical health conditions. That includes people who might be in, living in residential aged care. And so, again, I think the message I really want to get across is that we just need to go in and aggressively treat depression or sadness or loneliness in an older person in the same way that we might with a younger person. We know psychological interventions and particularly behavioural interventions are very effective in this population, just as effective as in young people, as well as um, you know, medications and antidepressants in particular. Um, so I could go on a little bit more about that, maybe we'll do we'll a little bit later. Um, and I just want to make one more comment here is, and that is that we know that keeping older people connected socially, and this really comes back to that point you were talking about be before Stephen and, and also you, Sandy, helping older people stay part of a community, making sure we maintain those connections with other people, their social groups, is a really important way that we can both treat depression but also starve off depression uh, forming in later years. Um, that, that's, that's great. That really frames, frames it up for us. Um, I'm just wondering what came to my mind was uh, there are, I know, in all of these audiences of these programs, some younger uh, practitioners, uh, healthcare workers, and a question that I'm sometimes asked is, how do I get consent to ask these kinds of questions? You know, we know we give consent in surgery, briefly, piece of paper shoved under our face, but people can be very... I'm not telling you anything or anyone anything they don't know, very touchy about their emotions. And we're usually not very good at sharing them. Sandy, have you um, found any resistance or do when people, you know, you're concerned about someone, they I, go straight for it? I think it's, it's about um, developing trust for them to, and in the residential setting, it's their home and we're working in their home. So I think it's less threatening perhaps mm -hmm. than uh, going to a doctor's surgery or the hospital to discuss your emotions. When they're in their own home, I think they you, you certainly don't ask those questions in the first 48 hours that they arrive on the doorstep, but give them time to settle in, get to know stuff and develop a rapport with them. And I haven't found resistance. I think people do, um, they, they do want someone to listen to them. Yeah, yeah. So is that what you've, you find? Because you would obviously see quite a lot of people in the consulting room and... Uh... Yeah, I think the disadvantage that I have compared to Sandy is if it's the first time, it's quite hard. You've really got to build that rapport. Um, and I think you do it and you do it with your body language and by giving examples um, of how they might be feeling and hopefully they open up. But sometimes it's the second or the third time you see them because that relationship that you develop is just so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know when, they, when, when our panel was speaking about trauma, they emphasise the importance of listening, 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 listening. So, Sue, um, you've become famous since your programs on the ABC showing the benefits of intergenerational care with your four-year-olds. How can we provide compassionate care to frail and sad elders in our communities? Look, Viv's partly answered this, I think, but what we need to remember is no matter what age we are, humans are pack animals. We need to stay connected. We need to belong. We need to belong whether it's to, you know, a family or a church or a community club or a football club. We need to belong. And as people get older, it is a time of loss. You lose your partner, you lose friends, you lose your health quite your often. Independence. You, yeah, your independence, exactly, Sandy. Um, you lose your identity often when you stop working. 
So it really is a time of loss and people do tend to become very isolated. And I think it is really, really important to keep older people connected. And I use that same word that Viv did. Um, clearly, as we showed in the TV series with four-year-olds, and hopefully soon you will see the series with teenagers, with Old People's Home for Teenagers, um, Intergenerational programs really can offer a great solution, but they're just one of the solutions. Um, and let's face it, we've got to get them up and running again with COVID. Um, but we know bringing older people together for activities that they're interested in is really, really important. And there's lots of work going on in this area. And Stephen, you would be aware of the Village Hub um, concept. So Sydney North um, Health Network has combined with Hornsby Council to develop what's called a village hub. And that's where people come together for social, physical, um, educational, um, arts, cultural activities that they're interested in and across diverse um, backgrounds, but it's bringing them together. Um, and I think that concept is really important in today's society when we, we have become very isolated. Um, and the whole concept of compassionate care. I would make one observation. COVID has really improved compassionate care in communities. I've seen it both where I work down the south coast of New South Wales. Also, um, I do some telehealth to Armidale in northwest um, New South Wales, as well as my work in Sydney. The development of, of, the, of the community in the neighbourhood has been amazing. It's like we needed to be given permission to talk to our our neighbours, particularly our older neighbours. And we have one neighbour who says he'll never finish the store of toilet paper because people, <laughs> neighbours, were leaving toilet paper on his on his front doorstep because they were worried he mightn't have had enough. But that sort of concept of, of neighbourliness, I think one of the positives, maybe one of the few positives of COVID is that that's brought it back to a degree and people have really pulled together. So, yeah, I, I give that as one example of a compassionate community. Mm. Wouldn't and it I, be, yep, go on, Sandy. I, I think that has very much been a, a positive for elderly people in the community. It wasn't such a positive experience for people living in residential aged care because we had so many rules and regulations that we, we had to, it, it eased up eventually, but in those early months, it was not good for the elderly at all. Mm -hmm. I hope we don't ever go down that path again. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, COVID brought that upon upon us, an infectious disease. Um, but, you know, we hear so much about the uh, chronic diseases of older life as we get older and live longer um that we don't prepare for having someone to watch our back as it were at difficult times um that's one of the the pillars of the compassionate communities concept is that you have an inner circle of people who you identify in advance to as you get older to be your supporters and you, that you do it mutually so it's caring with each other not for someone, so that um, that sense of cohesion, and 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 you mentioned um, the importance of kinship, uh, and I hadn't realised that the word kind comes from kin. It's something you show your kith and kin. So um, uh, that's uh, that's an important. Uh, aspect of, of care that we're, we're going to probably come back to, and it comes up in, in the next question that uh, Olive asked um, before the, the webinar started. Olive asked the question, how well are we prepared for people who want to remain at home despite their frailty? And that's open to, the, open to any of you who wants to jump in. 
Someone will have to be brave. I'll, I'll have a first go. It's also how well are the people themselves prepared um, yes. to live at home when they're frail because there's a limit to what I think we as service providers can do. And I think one of my big messages tonight when we're talking about the very negative, um, and it is a really negative title, ageing, loneliness, suicide and frailty. Yes. Gosh, we <laughs> couldn't have picked a more depressing um title in a lot of ways but the thing about frailty is you can do something about it in many different cases and I think that's something that's really important that we have to be thinking ourselves but for our our patients our clients how do we keep them as fit as we possibly can and it's interesting Sandy said you know they that people come into residential care they don't want to go into residential care no nobody or very few people do but once in there they get their medication regularly, they're getting regular food, they're getting the social interaction and quite often they're getting the exercise and it's amazing how people can do well. So we know both in residential care and at home, but we're not prepared for frail older people who live at home. Just have a look at our hospitals, our acute hospitals at the moment. They are full of older people whose medical problem is now being managed but they can't go home because they're too frail. They can't get out of bed. They can't take themselves to the toilet. So, yeah, we've got a we've got a bit of a problem, and we don't have enough services there. Um, so there's a lot of rethinking, I think, um, that has to be done in terms of how we prepare for all of us who want to stay at home and get carried out in a box. Um, we need to prepare ourselves as patients or clients or older mm. people as well as preparing our patients and encouraging them to be independent and do their physical exercise and eat properly is so important. Yeah, and that's where that little group of five or however many it is doing it together and, and all seeing that perhaps um, ageing, ageing is, um, well, you know, it, it's, it's got a stigma to it but it doesn't have to, proud of our one's age, proud of being an elder. Frailty, you've shown how clearly that can be turned around to something strong. Uh, loneliness, if we didn't have loneliness, it, we'd have no trigger to find someone else so to be with or other people to be with. So these are all, it sound, when, when I came up with that title, I thought it does sound, it does sound negative, but if we try and, without Pollyannaing it, see with, that these all need solutions. Um, suicide, another matter, that's certainly uh, an area which you, Viv, have, have uh, researched. Yeah. Anything to say on that, that last well, word? I mean, all these things are connected together, right? So we know that when someone is lonely, it increases their likelihood of developing depression. And then, of course, with, you know, depression, increased likelihood of suicidal ideation. We start to have people who are then socially withdrawing because of their depression or their isolation. They're not exercising as much. We start to have risk for frailty. So these things can't be thought of singly right I mean these things sort of come as a package not necessarily all together in the beginning but over time we see this you know complexity sort of building where people just develop more and more conditions and it becomes harder and harder to treat and so I think you know if we want to think about keeping people in their own homes yes we need to make some changes about the way we provide services because it is hard sometimes to get psychologists or social workers or physios into people's homes to help them right so we definitely need to change that but we also need to just um get better identifying these issues much earlier on because all of these things don't all just start suddenly all at once in this really severe way. I mean, it can sometimes with a hospitalisation or a fall, it can suddenly set off this cascade of uh, conditions. But often these things start to emerge over time. And I think as you know, health professionals, if we can be better at identifying these early warning signs, we start to see the depression creeping in, we start to see the socialisation building and we do something about it then, we really can then set people up to have much more... Um, independence, living, al living alone, living, living at home. But I just, that's something we don't do very well. Mm -hmm. I see that as the big, the big challenge for sustainability. 
because there's so much power in the community and as we saw from COVID, willingness. And the evidence is there that if you help someone and you, you care with them, your own health improves. So um, it's the, the loneliness and disconnection, Sandy. Yes, um, I did grow up in the country and I have very fond memories of growing up on a rural property out in the bush. But I do think that the rural communities do it a whole lot better than those of us that are in Metro. Uh, you can move, you know, move suburbs and it might take you six or 12 months to find someone else that lives in the street that's game to say hello to you. Mm. Where I do think rural communities do that uh, extremely well. Is that what you found in, in all of your work? The difference between remote and, and metro, country and metro? Me? Sue, go ahead, you, Sue? No. Sue, Bill? I think. Yes. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, it, it is in some ways easier to grow old in, in the more rural areas, but of course they do lack a lot of services. Of um, like geriatricians, um, which is why I guess I'm I'm involved, um, and we're trying to encourage some of our young ones out there. But it is, yeah, I think the sense of community is there, um, and I guess if you're living in the bush, you're pulling together more. We saw it, I think, down the south coast around the fires because, of course, they got them. Um, there was so much damage, and I know there are people listening tonight who lost quite a lot in that in those fires then we had COVID and there was a bit of a loss of community and then down the south coast they then had the floods um and Mogo and Maruya and Batemans Bay were flooded and people pulled together it was just amazing, amazing. It, is, it is a one it's an amazing way to to, to get to know your your neighbours although perhaps not the nicest but, yeah, that sense of community, that sense of belonging, I think is a little bit stronger. I won't say it's across the board, but it is certainly stronger in, in the regional um, and rural areas. So that is a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I was just going to jump in and say, I mean, we're sort of talking as though... Um, you know, when older people have these networks that they can lean on, right? But I guess... We have to remember, so for some older people, it's easy to activate these these connections, these networks, these supports and encourage them to get together with other people to exercise or to socialise. Um, but certainly in our research, we found that some of these people feel like they have nobody, like, like actually have nobody, like they just don't have family. Maybe they've moved away or they just don't want anything to do with them um, and they don't have friends and they're not sure how to go about actually making friends. And so I think it's important for us to also remember how hard it can be, even though socialising is really good, it can be really hard for an older mm -hmm. person to socialise. Mm -hmm. So older people, the, in, when we think about mental, um, mental disorders, Social phobia is still the most prevalent, um, other than specific phobias, of the mental disorders that an older person will have. So we still have older people who are shy and worry about meeting new people and afraid of conversations. Um, and so I think as mental health professionals, we need to remember that, that it's not as easy just to say to an older person, no. well, go on, join a social group. No, no. Well, go on, start to talk to your neighbours. We, we also need to think about what are the barriers to them doing that and what what can we do to try and solve some of those barriers? You know, can they start by talking to the neighbour? Is there actually a neighbour down the street who is the neighbour that, you know, says hello when they put the bin out? Can we start with a little bit more of a conversation there? Can we find out about what local community groups are happening and can we try and match them to one that matches their interests, right? So at least their interests might get them there rather than meeting people. And I always have this rule of thumb when I'm talking to an older person about joining a new group. And I say, you have to go three times before you decide whether you don't want to go back. And that's because it takes a little while to become familiar with people. It takes a little while um, for someone to recognise that they've seen you a few times and to those more warm and friendly interactions to happen. So I think, yes, we definitely need to encourage older people, but we need to think about what barriers are they facing and what can we do that are just practical and simple and straightforward that might help to break down some of those barriers? Yeah. 
Can I butt in and say a common interest will bring people together? I have watched um, older men who did not want to go to the men's shed, and there's a few that still won't go to the men's shed, but you get them to the men's shed and they they have a common interest. So it's not like they have to be social, but suddenly there's something that they're interested in and quite often that they're good at. And I often think that's why football clubs are, are so popular because because you go, you're all wearing, um, you know, the same coloured scarves or sweaters. So there's that sort of sense of identity. It may not be a true sense, but I think that sort of thing is quite important. So having that that that, that activity that does bring them together, because I agree, Viv, you, it's very hard to get people. It's like taking children to school, yeah. you know, that those first few times. And your rule of threes is probably a good one. Um, you know, we always try and make sure that that there's something of interest, whether it's art or you, you've got to find something that, that will hold the older person and give them a link so that they can then develop those friendships um, yeah. because, yeah, there are people yeah. who have nobody. Yeah, like social work. Yeah, carry on. Oh, no, I'm just so excited by what Sue was saying. I just want to add one more thing. So there's this <laughs> really cool research, I wish it was mine, but it's not mine, um, that's, been, that's been done from the University of Queensland that have actually really shown the benefit of social groups and social groups being better for mental health, better for physical health and better for cognitive health than so individual social interactions. So there's something special about helping people connect with groups, right? And it's about how they feel valued within groups that seems important. And the cool research they've done is that it depends on how many social groups you have, how good your cognitive or how slow your cognitive decline will be, right? So you want older people to not just have one social activity, but three or four social activities. Yep. Sue, I mean, you showed that so clearly in your in your. ABC program. Mm. Uh, and the, the, those older people who are so brave to show their their reticence to, uh, to come to your to yeah, your uh, and and yet when they got there, it was wonderful. And and I think that's that will be clear in series three as well. There were people who really did not want to be there, mm. but when you got an activity that engaged them, often with the teenagers, um, they were doing it. And further to Viv's comments, we know that um, to, to stave off dementia or prevent it or, or slow its decline, social interaction is just so important and mental activity. And it's one of those 12 risk factors that um, that we, we need to look at. And I just want to mention loneliness. We've talked about loneliness. Loneliness is as bad as smoking for your health. And I think that's a fact a lot of people don't realise, but loneliness contributes to depression and, you know, the ongoing, the possible risk of suicide. But it's also a risk factor for heart disease, for stroke and for dementia, equal to smoking. And we spend all this time making sure people don't smoke. Um, but we should be thinking about the effects of loneliness as well. So there's lots and lots of really good reasons to address it. I did want to make Sorry. that point. Now, Sandy, I mean, you, you said before the benefit of coming into, a, into an aged care facility. Uh, You're muted. Yes, sorry. Um, as both Viv and Sue were talking, I was busting to say that, um, that there are some good things about residential aged care because we do provide that sense of community. You know, as they're heading down the, the corridor to go to the dining room, you know, they pick up Mary and Fred on the way and they've got an instant group of friends that they take with them. Uh, at a home I commissioned, Stephen, you will know this one, uh, when we were setting up the home, we were new in the community, no one knew us. Um, and when we were trying to work out activities programs, we, you know, the old bingo came out. Well, no one was going to play bingo. And I can tell you within, within a very short period of time, they were killing each other to get to the bingo game because it was competitive. 
I've never played. They tell me it's competitive. It's competitive. It's, it's you know, it's a challenge for them. They have to think um, and they walk away with it knowing that they got the Freddo Frog or whatever it was that, that won the game of bingo. So, so I do think... Um, I keep going back to this because it's it's something that I've heard so many times about the negativity of of, of residential care, but there are some positives. I'm all for keeping people out in the community for as long as possible, but when it's not possible any longer, we we're not all that bad. Yep, and also one of the advantages of an aged care facility is sometimes whether they like it or not, there is a culturally and linguistically diverse uh, environment. One of the comments I always get is that the place is full of old people. And, and I say, well, actually, I've got more young staff looking after you than there are actually elderly people. So they, back to the kindergarten uh, or the impact of young children, on the elderly, the fact that they're being looked after by 20 to, predominantly 20 to 30 year olds, um, and they're hearing about what they did on the weekend, uh, it's not all bad. Yep. So questions are coming in, and um, uh, it, prior to the to the webinar, Susan and Julia brought up the the issue, and and this evening, Julian brings up the same issue. Um, what psychological and other treatment services are there for people with poor mental health in aged care facilities? I know that uh, some or all of the PHNs have been federally funded to commission mental health services into aged care facilities for individuals, groups and family support. And the one in our PHN is called Emotional Wellbeing for Older People. And of course, GPs can provide services themselves or refer to other mental health professionals, both in the aged care facilities at the moment under the COVID rules and into the community by the back better access. But do any of you see hey, I, another avenue? I see you, Sandy, wanting to. I've, I've actually had um, the Emotional Wellbeing for Older People program in um, a couple of the nursing homes that I've looked after and uh, families love it. And the, the actual residents uh, really have benefited enormously from having that, uh, that support. And they do it as, as a one-on-one a -on -one, or they might do it as a group. Uh, men quite often get lost in nursing homes because it's predominantly women. So, so having that program in the, the facility has been a fantastic support. Great. Yeah, now that's been my experience and it's so good to have something that we can offer. It's, it's really been a, a gap, mm. um, a gap that you can get those services if you're out, out of an aged care facility, but not if you're in one. So that's been a, a big move. Anything to add to that before? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a bit of a change. Some of the uh, facilities do actually contract psychologists or people to be there on on site, all right? So, but not all of them. In fact, very few of them. You can. There are some uh, private psychologists that might come in through the better access to mental health uh, plans. Again, not a lot. We're working very, very hard as psychologists in terms of trying to upskill and train our psychologists to go and work more with this particular population. Um, the older adult mental health services will sometimes go and see people in residential aged care facilities. Um, but there is a um, there is a telehealth service, which some of you may not know about. So Swinburne University uh, down in Victoria actually have a national telehealth program where for free they will do uh, counselling for um, older people in aged care facilities. Um, it's actually run by the students, so the psychology registrars under supervision of very, very experienced uh, people down there. So look them up because that is definitely an option and I know it was a very important option for a lot of residents during the uh, COVID pandemic. But the problems we have getting older people to have um, access to services in residential aged care is actually not all that dissimilar. It is harder, but not that dissimilar for older people in the community. 
So it's also pretty hard to find somewhere for an older person in the community. Um, and it's really the same avenue. So there are private psychologists, the older adult mental health service. Um, and actually at Macquarie Uni, we actually have a national uh, service, which is a, a telehealth or face-to-face -face service that we do through the Centre for Emotional Health there as well. So I'm hoping we're going to have more and more of these sorts of services where people can access it because it is, it is a huge gap. Um, and I think it's partly about embedding new services, but partly about just up skilling the whole range of professionals we already have out there who are more than capable with a few little um, skills learning how that they can go into these facilities or into community settings and use the knowledge they already have um, in this age group because we know those psychological strategies are just as helpful um, yeah. in this group. And if you think of mental health first aid how one can also train up people in community to be aware of that, what you were saying earlier about, you know, you see someone and they, they, they're looking glum. Yeah. And uh, if you can, with consent, make, reach out to that person, that, that's, yeah. that's a great I, help. Absolutely. And in terms of, you know, what skills work, we know that some really simple behavioural stuff goes a really long way. So it doesn't, someone doesn't have to become a clinical psychologist to help mm. an older person with depression. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, one of the, the skills that has the most evidence for it is what we call activity scheduling. Um, you know, in layperson's terms, it's getting people back involved in doing activities that they find pleasurable, mm. right? Mm. Um, and so any of us can help somebody else to do that, you know? Help them remember how, what their favourite music is and how to put it on. What's their favourite movies? Getting them to go for a nice little walk. Um, giving themselves time to have a cup of tea or make their favourite cake. Or give, calling up a friend. Mm -hmm. And they sound ridiculous in, in terms of its simplicity, but we know they're incredibly effective. Yep. And I know yep. during COVID I did a webinar and, and journalists were saying to me, oh, my goodness, we're all glum. We've all got that COVID downer. And you might have all forgotten this, but I remember it. And I said, this is when we have to do these really simple things where we give ourselves yep. a moment to do the little pick me ups yep. um, and there's stuff that yep. anyone can do. Mm -hmm. No, I remember a social worker saying to me, when you go into someone's home or you're speaking to someone and they say, I've got no friends and I've got nothing I want to do. And she made the, the nice metaphor of uh, you think the larder is empty, but actually let's go in and have a look at what's in the larder. And sometimes you find quite enough to make a good meal or to make a move towards um, uh, some recovery from that from that sad state. It's back to giving them a voice and and for us to listen to what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Very much so. So I'm sure some of the more um, medicalised um, uh, participants um, I might want an answer that Sue put in the um, in the questions beforehand, um, and, and we've had lots of questions beforehand on this. Uh, what is the link between chronic physical ill health and mental ill health, or vice versa? So it's a huge topic, and you basically all got about uh, five minutes to answer it. <laughs> I'll take less. Um, look, we know that chronic illness and associated physical frailty can lead to social isolation and loneliness. And I've already rabbited on about how important loneliness is as a risk factor for lots of things. So you've got those, so it increases your chance of depression, anxiety, um, and then you socially withdraw. And so you don't move as much, so you become more frail. And it's this vicious cycle. And our job is to break that so that people don't withdraw from society and, and become physically isolated and there's so much out there now for chronic and complex um, disease management um, a lot of it is self um, management and coaching there's a bit of that there as well but there is a lot we can do but I think the important thing is to reassure our patients that just because they've got a chronic illness it's not the end of the line people live with chronic illness for many many years and it's seeing the positive side rather than the negative and teaching them the good things that they can do um, it's it's how we spin it and Viv's probably got a, a much more official name for it but it's really getting them to see the positive side you know it's the glass half full hey you know 
know, you're still alive. Um, this is what you can do. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I think we, we all have a role to play there in our own little ways to encourage people because you mentioned medicalising things, Stephen, and we do tend to reach for the script pad um, because it's easy and quick, but it's not usually effective, um, certainly not like some of these other strategies we've been hearing about. Thanks. And that would probably include, seeing as you're a geriatrician, lest we forget, um, um, the, the kinds of medication. It's very much after the Royal Commission on everyone's mind, the kinds of medications that are used to alter behaviour. Now, it's a huge topic. I'm sure Sandy's, you know, faced this. Uh, we all know that, that non-pharmaceutical non remedies are better, but this is a, it is a problem, isn't it? Can I just say there are some people for whom a pharmacological solution is the right one. For those people who are very depressed or who really are psychotic, um, I think, you know, I will reach for the script pad. Um, but they're not the majority, I don't feel. And I think we have to try all the non-pharmacological measures first. And I know Sandy's very good at that because we did share a patient <laughs> where we tried everything. We did. Um, and I would and ring you, Sue, and say I've tried every little trick in my book <laughs> and it's not working. <laughs> just give us a few tricks, Sandy. Give us a few. Just give us the a, an overview of the kinds of things because I think they probably would would be helpful for people who are in the community as well, whose uh, behaviour might be challenging to family or the, the similar sorts of strategies might be helpful. So when one strategy doesn't work, you've got to try another one and then you try another one. So you have to, I don't think there's any one strategy. No. Um, but it's, it's trying different things, looking at how that person reacts to it and then when when it's not being effective, trying something else. Uh, I could give you many examples of some of the things, you know, the person who came down into my office every single day, probably two or three times a day, um, swearing about their relative that put them in this terrible place and where's my suitcase because I'm going home. Now, every day, twice a day or more often, we would discuss the suitcase and I'd be looking for it. And I and then I found that she went to Loretto and uh, there was, so then I could talk to her about her schooling, which is probably where she was sitting. And, and then that uh, created a diversion for her. So if I was to be irritated by those multiple visits into my office, perhaps we would have gone down the pharmacological um, pathway. So there are, and in certainly in uh, the residential setting, we actually have to look at every option before we pick up that phone and say, hey, Sue, can you give me a hand here? Um, we have to be able to demonstrate that we have tried all these other little tricks uh, or, or, or strategies, not tricks, they're strategies to, to help people. Yep. Can I jump in with yep. the concept of therapeutic fibbing? Um, now this like is something, it. and and I, I I speak from both my professional experience, but my mum had had dementia, my grandmother had dementia. She lived with us, so I've lived with dementia most of my life, both professionally and personally. Therapeutic fibbing is wonderful, and it actually has a literature around it. So you know, when mum would say, "Now I don't know where your father is," dad had been dead for a while, I would say, "Oh, mum, you know what dad was like." always at meetings and she'd say yes yes you're right but what was interesting was when the staff at the facility would say to her um, when she asked that question oh he's probably at Bunnings she'd look at them and say rubbish he's never been to a hardware store in his life <laughs> um, so you have to you know you the have story. To be careful and therapeutic fibbing is where you actually go into the person's situation you you see it from their point of view so you know I don't don't call it therapeutic lying because it's more it's more white lies and I was thinking about it 
And I thought we do it all the time professionally. We're not going to tell someone who's got a really bad prognosis, you're going to be dead by Christmas. You try, you, you, you couch it slightly differently. Um, so I think that concept of therapeutic fibbing, you, you distracted, which is wonderful. And I think we, we've all learned to do that. But it's all the different ways you can do that. And I have to say where mum was, they were very good at that. Um, and, and I think that's something that residential care staff do excel at and that's why we don't use perhaps as much medication as might happen otherwise but I think we need to say therapeutic fibbing is okay and I say that to my patients who say no I have to correct her and I say no you don't have to correct her for her it's Wednesday even if it's Saturday mm. that doesn't matter it's not fatal Mm. Um, and I think that's where we, you know, it's important to say that we can we can bend the truth a little bit if it reduces distress and anxiety. But I'll stop there. You've made my day, Sue. I'm going to hang on to that. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's it's that's a very important strategy. Um, I'd uh, I'm very keen to get this um, question in. Um, for for many reasons, um, what are the challenges of pre-existing disability for aging people and their mental health? Can I just say that's uh, it's a double whammy. Aging with a disability is a double whammy, um, and we need to make sure we take that underlying disability into account. And I have to think like that because I won't have seen the person when they were younger, but we're seeing them now. And so you really need to think about what that is. And I think about people with polio. They've actually lived with that disability all their life. It's getting maybe a little worse or they've developed something else. But they know their own issues well. And I think Sandy and Viv have both said this. We need to listen to the person and ask them how they are managing, how they would like to. So it is, yeah, it's... It, really is an interesting situation and people with disabilities like um, spinal cord injury I know it's not common but they age faster their systems age faster after a spinal cord injury than someone of the same age who didn't have a spinal cord injury so it's kind of having a little bit of knowledge of how the underlying disability will affect the aging process. <laughs> It's an issue at the moment, isn't it, Sandy, in terms of people with disability uh, being looked after in aged care facilities? Young people in aged care facilities. It's not easy and and they, they're not with their peers. So the, the, all the 80 and 90 year olds are with people with common stories and life experiences and then suddenly you put a 30 year old in there, it's, uh, it's not the best spot for them. And we hope it's about to change, but we'll see. Viv, have you had any experience in this area of um, uh, disability? Let's see, my internet's a bit dodgy. I'll see if I can That's answer right. that question. Um, uh, yes, and I agree really with what the others have said, um, but also just to say that, you know, it's not a given though. I mean, different, we have to remember that all older people are not the same. They all come with their own personalities and some are just more resilient than others in the same as younger people are. So, um, yeah, there are lots of older people who uh, can just get on with it despite pre-existing disabilities, um, get on with it probably better than most of us do. So, yeah, I just wanted to sort of be mindful of the fact mm -hmm. that I think we do have to be careful not to just make assumptions about older people and how they will cope um, given different sorts of life circumstances as well as different sorts of health. Mm, yeah, very much so. Um, we've had a, a question come in about frailty in acute care, and this comes back to all of our discussions, I think, and probably it's been answered to some degree. How do you think acute hospital staff can help older people with frailty believe that they can take the steps to reduce their frailty? Um, 
Speaking from experience, we are doing that study at the moment and it is very interesting. We're screening for frailty in people in, in the acute wards after they're admitted. And the number of older people that don't want to be called frail when they mm. clearly are very frail <laughs> and we're taking a very positive attitude. If they've lost weight, we look at dietary interventions. If, they're, if they can't walk up you know, a flight of stairs or even two stairs, we look at physio interventions. If they're on lots of medication, as unfortunately a lot of them are, we look at a pharmacist um, having a look at their medication. So we're actually actively treating their frailty as much as possible. But what is interesting is the number of older people that actually aren't all that interested in being <laughs> treated. Um, and not, it's not a lot. But it is a few, and I do think that's going to be an issue. Mind you, if you're in an acute hospital bed, you're probably reasonably unwell. And even if you're getting better because you've spent a few days in bed, you are going to be a lot worse than you were when you came in from a functional point of view. So it is hard, but we are very much addressing frailty now. It's, it's top of mind because it underpins falls, it underpins long length of stay, um, and, and it contributes to so many other um, unpleasant outcomes. So I think watch this space as far as frailty goes. Has anyone got uh, a better word for frailty? One that doesn't doesn't have the stigma attached to it. I know it's really hard. I mean, I, you know, I hope it's going to come to me one day in the shower that, aha, you know, this is the word. But uh, it, it's hard to get it into one or two words. But I think it is a stigma that um, we're, we're building, perhaps, uh, with the best of intentions, because we want to identify these people, but and yet it it does have a stigma for some people. It is a diagnosis, and that's always hard to take a diagnosis. So um, I'm wondering if um, if uh, as it were one by one, you could take a few minutes. We've got slightly longer than 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 just a couple of minutes, just to sum up the the learnings as it were for you from the title of the of the webinar um what what the main challenges may be and uh how hopeful you are that things are going to improve even with the workforce challenges um who'd like to go first sandy very keen to jump in there you'll have to unmute though there we go <laughs> I don't know how keen I am if I'm still on mute. Um, I think it's it's we've covered it really well in in terms of we're all looking at uh, keeping the older person socialised, not isolated in the community, can be the key to delaying their entry into residential care, um, and that as as uh, Sue was saying. Um, linking them with their neighbours, with community groups, with uh, the hub that Sue was talking about. I think definitely that will, those sort of links, and I, I do see that people who have been um, well linked in the community are coming into residential care a lot later. Than, than the 70 year old that's isolated themselves or the 75 year old that's isolated themselves because of their perception that they're too frail to do this or perhaps they're too depressed to do do something. They will, they will enter residential aged care a lot faster. In terms of when they, they come into care, um, what we have to offer to open their worlds up, we do music therapy, pet therapy. When when was the last time a 92-year-old went to a concert? We bring the concert to them. Um, tai Chi, art therapy. Um, we bring the kindergartens into the nursing home. So so as much as they can't get out, we try and bring those, those socialising aspects of life to them. And I think we do that well. Yep. Yeah, you certainly you certainly do. Is, is there any um, possibility, do you think, in the future of doing aged care facilities so well that people will return to their their um, lives in community? How much do you see that? 
I, I think that I'd love to see it happen, but I think we're doing that out in the community. We're keeping them out in the community longer. So by the time they get to us, they're, you know, 25, 30 years ago, you saw 60 year olds in a nursing home. Thank heavens you don't do that anymore. Um, so, Viv, stop laughing. Um, <laughs> We don't see the 60 year olds in nursing homes anymore because we, they've, they've, we've got a lot of supports out in the community. We're now seeing the mid to late 80s and early 90s coming into a nursing home. Mm, mm, mm. So I think that's a good thing. Okay. Yep. But, but to, I mean, we do get them out. And it, we, it's more about getting the community into them. I, I, as much as I'd love to see it, for them to have the, the physical ability to go back to bowls at the local bowling club, I think might be difficult. Yep. Yep. Viv, would you like to sum up um, and... Well, I, was, I guess my final thoughts are really just, we just have to um, not give up on older people at any point, um, whether they're in the community or whether they're in the aged care facility or whether they have comorbid conditions and frailty and depression and loneliness and suicide all rolled in together. Um, I think we need to um, be much more aggressive as professionals in terms of looking for these symptoms early on and treating them preventatively and giving them the best quality evidence and, and evidence-based um, intervention, sorry, rather than, um, so yeah, making sure we don't give up. We give them the best that we can. Um, I think there's going to be a move to a lot more prevention, and I really hope we do, because quite a few of the issues we're talking about un unfortunately start in the our 40s and 50s, right? The, the poor health, the lack of exercise, the shrinking social networks. Um, these are all the things that's, that happen in midlife that actually set people up not to have great um, time in later life. So I think, yeah, let's not be complacent. Let's just jump in and try and keep people as well as they can be right to the end. And just a, a word on suicide, because it is in our title. And mm. again, if there's a stigma around, it's the stigma of not talking about suicide, which, you know, that's why I thought it was keen. I was keen to put it in there. Um, and um, what, what are the statistics? Are they is this the rate of suicide going up in older people or I don't look I don't know about them going up I don't think it's necessarily changed that much but we still know that the highest suicide rates in Australia are for uh, men now and around their 30s it used to be younger men and now men aged 75 and above all right and mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that older men are more suicidal, that there are more of them walking around feeling like they want to commit suicide. It seems most likely um, that they're just much more successful, that when an, an older person decides they are feeling suicidal, they will follow through and they will do it successfully. Um, so I just think, yeah, we have to take depression seriously because when they look back at the research of uh, um, successful suicides in older men, uh, something like 80% of their medical records will indicate that these, this person had symptoms of depression, right? So, again, depression is just one of those clues, social isolation is one of those clues that says we need to screen, we need to check in if they're okay, and we need to ask what it is we can do to help, and we need to uh, treat, treat it aggressively. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Have the conversation. So. I and by the way, someone wanted to know when your someone in the audience wanted to know when your uh, teenage uh, version of intergenerational care is coming up. Old, old people's home for teenagers. Yes, yep. it, it goes to where we think it'll be later this year. It's in post production at the moment, so hopefully, hopefully later this year. Um, Stephen, I think Sandy and Viv have said almost everything I wanted to say, or I've already said it about loneliness, about the fact we can do something, and I think the, Viv made the comment about sort of we need to get people when they're younger, my comment was going to be start now. We know that even at 85, you can improve your strength and balance with um, with exercise. In fact, you probably improve more than, than younger people. So it's never too late to start. And I think that's the message. And Viv used the word aggressive. Um, I think that's what we've 
got to be really pushy when we do this. Um, and because the results are there, if you do this, the evidence shows us you can improve older people's lives. And it's making sure they know that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's back to public health, isn't it? And the social determinants of health. It's the same old messages and uh, the, the savings, if we go to the economics of good prevention and being aware of things like transport and education and literacy and community really are the, the cornerstones of um, what, what it certainly, if you read the press, sounds like a very depressing situation. But um, I think I think everyone's expressed the same um, motto: um, look at what's strong, not what's wrong. Certainly, acknowledge what's what's wrong, but um, but try and and uh, develop a, an attitude of what's strong, which is why frail is such a challenging word. <laughs> So um, thank you all. Um, I'm going to move on with the um, with the closing agenda. Um, but no, it's, I, I hope you've all enjoyed this conversation. I certainly have. And uh, you bringing all of the uh, varied uh, uh, outlooks on on this topic has really um, added to my my understanding of um, what needs to be done. Let's think of what needs to be done as well as what we're doing already. So thank you all very much. Um, and just hang in there while I go through the, uh, the, closing, the closing comments, which um, is to remind everyone that the resources for this webinar are posted in the supporting resources tab, which everyone's probably now familiar with. And you will receive follow-up communication from MHPN with the recording of this activity. And as I said to you earlier, please, please share this with your colleagues. Uh, have, a, have a little uh, loneliness party to talk about loneliness in, in aged care. A lot of this is really just getting groups together. Um, what you were saying, as I think everyone said, is let's, um, let's meet up and talk about these things before it gets too late, so we're not doing what um, what the governments, uh, that word that's in the press all the time, scrambling. How often does one get a call on a Friday evening or um, uh, because something's happened and there's no one to look after them or no one to have their back? So let's all, you know, no one, no one in this, in this uh, panel is young. <laughs> so, you know, we can all be good examples and and make sure we've all got someone to um, to help us. And I suppose watching this webinar with friends is as good a way as any to start with, with a nice dinner. Um, so MHPN supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks, where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, share tips and resources, and build local referral pathways and in, engage sometimes in CPD activities. I personally have found the MHPN a, a, a wonderful resource, uh, not only in my work with older people, um, but obviously when you go on their website, if your interests are to the whole range of mental health issues, that is Mental Health Professionals Network, it isn't restricted to older people alone. And indeed, next week, um, on the 6th of July, uh, there is a webinar on Tourette's syndrome. So but if you go back into the library, you'll see resources on a whole range of topics. Uh, for our um, local network in North Sydney, um, uh, they've been great in supporting our special interest network. And uh, we've shown films, invited speakers on a wide range of uh, people working with older people, uh, First Nation elders, art and music therapists, psychiatrists and psychologists, and uh, social and mental health workers. And um, it's, it's been a little fallow during COVID, 
but um, uh, this is one of our meetings for this year and there'll be another one as well. So if you're interested, um, you should make contact with MHPN via the network section of their website. Now, there will be one more webinar in 2022, part of this series, uh, the sixth one, um, by way of partnership uh, between the 31 PHNs and the Mental Health Professional Network. So keep an eye out for future communications. Um, and as every, every time that something like this happens, of course, you have to, or we would like you to fill out the exit survey. So that's very helpful for us to, to improve, continue to improve our, our service to you. Um, I hope that this evening's webinar may help you tomorrow and onwards in your commitment to your work as you care for and with older people. So uh, let's be let's be strong and not focus too much on what's wrong, but be able to identify it. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. And thank you for your questions. Look forward to seeing you at the uh, next webinar, which we will announce in good time. Thank you all.